This video is a little different than most of my content, but I've been getting a lot of questions lately and I want to take this time to address them. Let me apologize now for any background noise you may hear in this video. I'm traveling right now and I'm recording this in a hotel room and this room is not at all built like a sound studio. Anyway, today I want to discuss some of what I believe is really going on with YouTube, specifically in relation to gun channels and firearms related content. So, do gun channels have a future on YouTube and if so, what will it look like? There's been a lot of talk over the last several months about YouTube's treatment of gun channels and a lot of speculation of what might happen to them. Uh, there's also been a lot of discussion of the need for a new home away from YouTube and the lack of good alternatives. Be uh, before I get into all the details I want to cover in this video, let me give you a quick summary and then I'll expand on it. So here's the short version of what's going on. YouTube has had a very hard 17 months. Bad publicity has cost them more than a billion dollars, and YouTube is taking the necessary steps to shield themselves from such losses in the future. Like most businesses, YouTube is in the business of making money. And firearms content has been identified as a risk that needs to be managed. So, here's the bottom line up front. A few months ago, YouTube began taking steps that will force firearms-related content to become more and more safe or less risky for them. Content creators, the folks that make the videos you enjoy watching on YouTube that want freedom of content choice and freedom of expression will eventually have to find a venue other than YouTube. And there's no better time than the present to begin the migration away from YouTube. Let's take a real quick look at some history to help shed some light on the current realities. On February 14, 2005, YouTube, um, YouTube.com became a thing. That was a little more than 13 years ago. YouTube was launched by three former PayPal employees, and they uploaded the very first video a little more than two months later. The official launch was in December 2005, and was primarily funded by an $11.5 million investment. It was then acquired by Google in November of 2006 for $1.65 billion in Google stock. YouTube grew quite a bit in those first few months, but Google has owned YouTube for most of, its, it, most of its existence. I often hear people describe the glory days of YouTube and how it was a great thing before Google got involved. But when you look at the, uh, this timeline, you can see that Google got involved very early on. It's estimated that there are more than 400 hours of content uploaded to YouTube each minute, and 1 billion hours of content are watched on YouTube every day. It's the second most popular website in the world and has at least 800 million unique users a month. That all sounds pretty successful, but 2017 was a hard year for YouTube. Uh, YouTube. They had trouble all year long that started in January and lasted until the very last day of the year. Uh, 2018 hasn't been much better. Their PR team dealt with scandal after scandal. I certainly haven't captured everything, and a few of the fine details may be off a touch, but let's take a look at some of the events that have taken place over the last 17 months. On January, 7, uh, January 11th, PewDiePie, which I believe was YouTube's largest channel with something like 54 million subscribers, got in trouble for posting anti-Semitic content in one of his videos. On February 9th, the Times of London ran an article reporting that ads were being played on terrorist propaganda videos. Then, on February 14th, the Wall Street Journal highlighted the PewDiePie incident, claiming YouTube wasn't doing anything about it. Advertisers, more than 250 brands, began pulling their ads from YouTube. YouTube's financials have always remained private, but it's estimated that YouTube's loss was between $750 million and a billion dollars. YouTube all of a sudden had a big black eye, the damage to their brand was massive, and it came at a huge sudden uh, financial cost. The traditional media probably had several reasons for reporting this, these issues, uh, not the least of which was that billions of advertiser dollars were going to YouTube instead of the traditional media, and if they could give YouTube a black eye, then they would likely be the outlets that the advertisers would once again turn to. On March 17th, the Times of London ran an article highlighting that ads were running on videos filled with hate speech, and then on March 24th, the Wall Street Journal ran an article highlighting that ads were running on racist videos. All this led up to what is now known as Adpocalypse. YouTube lost a ton of money, and therefore they had a lot less ad revenue to share with the content creators. 
the video creators all of a sudden took a 70 to 85 percent cut in their ad revenue. That means creators' earnings were unexpectedly cut to only 15 to 30 percent of what they had been getting. Imagine working a steady job for $20 an hour and then showing up one day to find that your pay had been cut to $3 an hour. That's why you heard an uproar from many of the video creators. YouTube had to do something, and quick. Uh, in March, they divided all the YouTube content into categories and gave advertisers options about which categories they wanted to let their advertisements run on. And a few days later, they changed their minimum view requirements and application process uh, for new channels that wanted to be monetized. But the hits kept coming. Later that month, it was highlighted that a very popular YouTube channel was actually showing child abuse and making money from it. The channel was making an estimated $200,000 to $350,000 annually off of this garbage. YouTube couldn't seem to get their name out of the news. In June, there was an incident at something called VidCon, which became uh, referred to as Gamergate. Several YouTube uh, personalities were having some very public problems, and it was more bad publicity for YouTube. And here's where we start talking about firearms. The categories that YouTube had created in March had lumped firearms-related content in with a bunch of content that advertisers would likely want to avoid. If you're not already aware, Google and YouTube corporately do not like firearms, and their $2 million donation in July to gun control groups is just one example of that. Things started to get very interesting last fall. On October 1st, a number of people were murdered in Las Vegas. This was a major media event, and a lot of the media focus was on the murder weapons used to commit these horrible, horrible homicides. In this case, semi-automatic rifles with bump stocks. On October 26th, YouTube rolled out a new algorithm, which they claimed would help good content from being inappropriately marked as unsuitable for ads by their computers. Uh, that same month, a number of firearms channels received community guideline strikes. This included uh, Such, uh, James Yeager, Big Shooterist, and what's really interesting about uh, that one was that one of his strikes was for a video that was marked private. Uh, also, the Military Arms Channel, Demolition Ranch, 22 Plinkster, and several others. Much of this was for benign content that was several years old, and it left the entire community wondering what was really going on. Early the next month, on November 5th, a man walked into a church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, and began murdering the parishioners. A local hero heard the shots, ran out the door barefoot with his own AR-15, and engaged the killer. He was then aided by another local hero as they gave chase uh, to the fleeing murderer, and they were able to stop him before law enforcement could respond. But YouTube had other drama to deal with. Uh, just one day before that, the New York Times polished, uh, published an article exposing the fact that there were a whole host of videos showing cartoon characters involved in all sorts of deviant behavior to include uh, hard drugs, abusing babies, sexual content, uh, committing acts of violence. And these videos were showing up in the child-friendly part of YouTube, like YouTube Kids. And again, earning ad revenue and all this was getting by the YouTube filters. As a result, YouTube ended up removing more than 150,000 videos across 270 accounts in about a week toward the end of November, and also claimed that they um, removed ads from nearly 2 million videos and over 50,000 channels masquerading as family-friendly content. This incident became known as Elsagate, and once again it cost YouTube an awful lot of ad revenue. On November 29th, they updated their algorithms again, in, this time in order to protect the children. Once they had that cleaned up, they were free again to mess with the gun channels. And so in December, they again gave strikes to Such, to Hickok 45 and the Military Arms Channel. And uh, James Yeager's channel just got banned. Days later, YouTube found themselves in the news again. On December 31st, Logan Paul, who was a Google preferred partner, which is supposed to be their curated and polished and popular content, and also means he benefits from their algorithms for top paying ads, he got millions of views on a video that brought them a lot of heat involving finding the body of someone that had committed suicide. On January 16th, YouTube announced the latest monetization change where the creators have, have to have at least 4,000 hours of watch time within the past 12 months and at least 1,000 subscribers. On February 14th uh, were, the, were the horrible murders at this school in Parkland, Florida. This was after months of scandals regarding YouTube's inability to properly moderate the content published on its platform. 
Folks got real upset when a video suggesting that the Parkland incident involved crisis hackers. Um, and that video showed up in the trending videos list. A few days later, YouTube banned a bunch of so-called conspiracy theorists and once again sent a warning to the gun community by banning Hank Strange and issuing strikes to Hickok 45, 22 planks during the Military Arms Channel. And they also deleted three of the Military Arms Channel's videos. That month, they also began testing uh, changes to the use YouTube subscription feed, but that didn't become public until just a few days ago. We'll talk more about that in a bit. On March 19th, YouTube released their new Policies on Content Featuring Firearms. A few days later, YouTube, uh, YouTube channel Never Enough Ammo received its first strike. A few days after that, on April 3rd, a woman entered the YouTube headquarters and attempted to murder several people with a sidearm. Around that same time, the Small Arms Solution channel was banned. Uh, Such and the AK Operators Union and Never Enough Ammo all received a second strike on their channels. All of these strikes were bogus, of course, but that doesn't matter. The AK Operators Union got their second strike for a 2015 video in which all they did was an interview. It was believed that on April 19th, the new policies concerning firearms would go into effect, and many feared that massive amounts of firearms content would disappear from YouTube that day. YouTube did end up in the news that day, but it was for something else. CNN ran an article titled, YouTube ran ads from hundreds of brands on extremist channels. The sub, uh, subtitle of that article stated, ads from over 300 companies and organizations ran on YouTube's channels promoting white nationalists, Nazis, pedophilia, conspiracy theories, and North Korean propaganda, a, a CNN investigation has found. One of the quotes in that article from a 20th, uh, 20th Century Fox spokesperson person said, YouTube has once again failed to correctly filter channels out of, um, out of our marketing buys. Uh, and May 18th, a teenager murdered several of his classmates in Santa Fe, Texas, and that was a, a major media event. Um, and then five days after that, the Bloke on the Range channel was banned. Moments after that, the channel also received its first strike. Uh, that was appealed. The appeal was rejected in a matter of minutes, but then the channel mysteriously came back a couple days later. Uh, it was, it's been a busy and drama-filled month, uh, or 17 months, uh, for YouTube and its uh, content creators. Bear with me for a few more minutes as we take a look at what YouTube is and where they're headed. You are the reason YouTube exists. They say that they're here to give you a voice, but really they're here to get your money. There are a few ways that they attempt to get your money, but let's look at a very simple and poorly illustrated model. YouTube provides a platform for people to post and distribute video content. They make this content available to you, and you watch it to be entertained, informed, educated, uh, for a number of reasons. There are companies in various industries that want you to buy their products, and so they want to be able to advertise to you. They give money to YouTube, and YouTube presents these advertisements along with the videos. Then, you spend your money on the products, and everyone is happy. It's a good system. But if it's a good system, it can be made a great system. So YouTube offers some of this ad money to creators. This encourages better content and more content and more creators. Better content and more content equals more users and more time, which means more advertisements displayed and more money spent. But the system is always changing. Remember the billion dollar loss and the ad apocalypse in the beginning of 2017? After that, YouTube was forced to make a bunch of changes. One of those changes was an even greater focus on creating premium content. YouTube's top 10 creators earned a collective $127 million in 2017, and they did it through ads. They can afford to pay the common video creator a lot less than they used to because more and more of their focus is on very specific and highly controlled content. They don't want to completely disenfranchise all the common content creators because they're viewers as well and they still need them to remain viewers so that they can put the ads in front of their eyes. But YouTube's main focus is on a small segment of their content. YouTube wants to compete with the likes of Netflix and Hulu and Amazon. Listen, YouTube won't even notice if a large portion of the non-celebrity creators stop posting videos. I found an article from The Hollywood Report dated October 4th of last year that was titled YouTube Grows Up, Inside the Plan to Take on Netflix and Hulu. Box office numbers are extremely low, traditional TV is suffering, but streaming video has become a huge deal over the last few years. 
just a few days ago, Netflix stocks closed at an all-time high. It was just announced, uh, announced that Telemundo and Hulu made a deal together. Amazon is in this game, and I believe Facebook and a couple others are jumping in as well. Here's a list of original content that YouTube has been offering. The titles in the ugly green are original films, and the rest are all original series. This is YouTube's plan to make most of their money. User-generated cat videos were great for 2005, but now exclusive content that they can curate and control with the attraction of celebrities, that's the way to their future. This is where they, uh, the high dollar ads are going to bring in their revenue. This content will bring millions of views in and with a lot less risk than the user uploaded content. On May 17th, YouTube announced the rebranding of YouTube Red as YouTube Premium, accompanied by a major expansion of the service into Canada and 13 European markets. They're going all in on this and they will not tolerate anything that would put it at risk. They no longer see the servers full of videos like this. They now see it like this. Imagine the green is safe for ads and the red is not, and there's some content that, that kind of rides the line right in the middle. Over the last 17 months, they kept getting bit by ads showing up on the content in red. They have a few plans to reduce the risk. One of the plans is to reduce the amount of risky content. I believe that's what the penalty box at the bottom of this represents. I believe they're trying to shape the content that gets uploaded to YouTube. They're becoming more civilized and we're no longer welcome at the table unless we put on a suit and tie, behave in a certain way, and never rock the boat. That's what the firearms content policy was all about in March. YouTube doesn't like firearms, but more than that, they really hate losing money. The things listed in this policy are things that the media is sure to latch onto. YouTube doesn't want to end up with any more black eyes in the news. In the reloading community, we kept asking about how do we interpret this part about providing instructions on manufacturing ammunition. We were asking the wrong people. YouTube was the wrong place to ask. It's a matter of whether or not the media and the advertisers will take issue with it, not YouTube. Let me give you a plain English translation of this firearms policy. We don't allow content that can potentially cause public relations nightmares for us and result in loss of lots and lots of advertiser dollars. That pretty much sums up all of YouTube's policies. My channel is primarily focused on cast bullets and on reloading. I've had several viewers and other reloading channels over the last eight weeks ask if we've seen any signs of YouTube taking action against gun channels or reloading channels based on these policies. I haven't seen anything specific against reloading channels yet, but let me stress the word yet. Let me throw out a hypothetical but plausible situation. Imagine if an article like this showed up in the near future. YouTube once again funding dangerous extremists. Look, I know this article is silly, but that doesn't mean that someone won't write something similar. See if you can imagine this article showing up in one of the big newspapers. Once again, YouTube's failure to put effective filters in place and to take responsibility for the content that they host on their platform has led to a volatile situation that could enable the next wave of mass shootings. For years, which is certainly plenty of time for YouTube to have identified and dealt with the situation, Hundreds of channels have been producing a constant stream of videos aimed at detailed instruction in manufacturing ammunition. These reloading videos, as they're often referred to on YouTube, provide exact details for how to assemble unlicensed, unregulated, and in most cases untraceable bullets. There is no way of knowing just how much of this homemade ammunition has ended up on the streets or in secret uh, weapons caches around the country, but these videos, which number in the thousands, have been watched millions of times. Neither the FBI nor the Department of Homeland Security have any way of tracking the viewers or the ammunition that they have been making. It's estimate, estimated that millions of these homemade bullets, many of which are intended for high-powered assault rifles, military-style sniper rifles, and every handgun imaginable are already in existence. Uh, the article could go on to say, um, as is always the case with this type of discussion, voices from the far right will start chanting slogans about the Second Amendment. But let's not forget that the Second Amendment includes the words well-regulated, and there's nothing at all regulated about this current situation. Uh, just like in the past with terrorist propaganda videos, 
and other dangerous extremist content YouTube has ignored. Uh, you know, and then they could fish it up with something about and advertisements from brands X, Y, and Z have been running on these videos, effectively paying these groups to instruct and to recruit. Our entire community would be erased from YouTube in a matter of minutes. No questions asked. So, YouTube is working to reduce the risky and objectionable content. In their eyes, this includes firearms content. Some of it's okay, some of it's bad, and a lot of it probably sits right on the line. I believe they'll continue to allow it, but they'll want it reduced, and what remains they'll want to be shaped to match uh, certain criteria. And how are they going to achieve that? Like this. They're going to harass the community before it can become a problem. They aren't responding to specific content that's in violation. It's not only the gun community, but it certainly includes the gun community. They're bullying us. Apparently cyberbullying is bad, but it's okay when billions of dollars are at stake. They're not following their own policies, but they're following the overarching value that they have of make more money. They see us as a risk to that, and with the current media, we very well may be. Um, without a big specific event driving it, they're probably not going to start banning a bunch of channels, but they are actively working to make you afraid. They want you to be afraid. They want you to be so afraid that you'll even self-censor. And it's working. As long as they keep this up, the community is afraid to speak. Uh, we'll grumble, but we won't really speak out. And they've also worked to pretty much pull all ads um, and all not all ads, but all ad funding, which demoralizes the content creators. Their current actions are already shrinking the quality firearms content on YouTube. They're fighting the shadows, and they're winning. I mentioned before that in February, YouTube started testing a new feature where they're rearranging the subscription feed. This is another way that they can and will silence us. They're quarantining us. They're reducing the risk uh, for themselves of losing advertiser dollars while at the same time shaping the ideological discourse. By rearranging the subscription feed based on their algorithms instead of chronological order, they can very effectively hide all of the risky content. It can still exist, and if you know how to search for it and dig, you'll be able to find it, but YouTube will do everything within their power to get all users to see what they want them to see. It's a great strategy, and it's working for them. So what do we do? How do we proceed from here? I suggest we take this model and build something similar, but separate. Fighting YouTube is admirable, but it's a losing battle. Can we build something like this? Of course we can, if we organize a little bit. We have users that want to see the firearms content. We have content creators that want to make the content. There are advertisers that would like to advertise alongside this content. And there are video hosting services other than YouTube. It'll be rough for a while. It won't be as polished. Uh, we don't have access to the billions of dollars that YouTube does, but we can make it work. Look at Full30. They've been doing this for a while, and folks still complain about the format. And while Full30 has promised for some time that they'll be available for everyone, uh, we've seen no signs of that yet. It's still restricted to invite only, and they still aren't inviting. Um, we find ourselves in a go west and conquer situation. As we head west into the wilderness, there's lots of opportunity, but it's less refined, it's less certain, there's a lot of hard work, and there's a lot of freedom. Uh, community becomes even more crucial for success. It won't look exactly like this. We're going to need some of the industry to directly support some of the content creators. We may need some of the viewers to support some of the platforms, or the content creators, or maybe even both but we can make it happen. Here are a few things that have to happen in order for this to succeed. We can't wait until YouTube comes crashing down. Now is the time for the content creators to start planning, to start acting, to start, to start communicating their plans to their viewers and the rest of the firearms community. Hopefully each of the channels has their content backed up. If not, it's time to get busy. You can buy an external four terabyte hard drive for less than $90. Here's a shameless plug, but it's also an example. I posted a video in March showing procedures for how to download all of your YouTube videos and content. And then back in April, I started a website called the Reloaders Network. This was built as a gathering place for the folks that enjoy reloading, uh, bullet casting, firearms, and shooting sports related content. We currently have about 
40 content creators contributing, and that number is slowly growing. I suggest you think in terms of multi-platform. At the Reloaders Network, we can embed videos that are hosted on YouTube, Vimeo, BitChute, Twitch, Full30, uh, Daily Motion, YouTube, Gunstreamer, 1776 TV, or a number of other uh, sites. Some of these sites may not endure. Vidme closed down last November, and the GunTube closed down a few weeks ago. Being able to source from any of these sites keeps our community and interaction stable, even if the video hosting platforms are not yet. What's your forwarding address? And if you have to move in the middle of the night, do your viewers already know? For instance, uh, anyone watching that's watched my YouTube channel in the last couple of months knows that they can always find me at the reloadersnetwork.com. In fact, I've already transitioned, at least in mindset. I'm still on YouTube and will stay there as long as possible, but my base of operations, my home, is the Reloaders Network. I will use YouTube as a means of trying to recruit new folks to join us at the website, but I'm no longer exclusively a YouTuber. I'm an online content creator, and one of my outlets is a YouTube channel. A word of caution here. If your only forwarding address is Patreon, I'd caution you to reconsider. Your Patreon page is not a bad idea, but again, don't put all your eggs in that one basket. Patreon has banned channels before, and when it gets to a point that YouTube crushes your house, you may not get a warm reception at Patreon either. And to the viewers, it's not the technology that will determine where we all end up, and it's not necessarily the big gun channels. It's you, the viewers, that will make this succeed. You need to, starting now, encourage your favorite channels to, to start planning for the future now, to get their content on platforms other than YouTube, and to let you know where they are currently headed, or at least where you can find them when their YouTube channel turns into a crater. You need to support them. I'm not talking about financially, though that can be important as well. I'm talking about actually following them to their new platforms and then engaging with them there, commenting, liking, following them there. The content creators want to engage with their viewers, and if you're willing to migrate to the new platform, then they will be too. And finally, advertise. Once your favorite content creators set up their new home, help them advertise that on your social media pages with your friends at the gun range, however you can. Help to bring fresh blood to that new community so that it can grow and thrive. YouTube has found themselves continually having to recover from public relations crisis, which has meant very large financial crisis. They have recovered, but you can be certain that they are working hard to reshape the platform into a friendlier, more palatable place for viewers and especially for advertisers. They're going to harass us to quiet us down and then hide our content as they curate a space where they can exercise the precise control that's been lacking under all this user-made content. Our days on YouTube are not yet done, but they are numbered. Unless, of course, all you want to see is bland, safe content, and the bio means you should be good. I've never asked anyone to like, share, or subscribe, but I'm going to ask you to share this video. And if you've made it this far in the video, thank you for enduring this. Um, let's start the migration now, before it's too late.